What was your dishes, first job in the US? Pressure washing basketball courts. Cleaning toilets was my second job. Cleaning toilets. Yeah. Started drop shipping probably about six to seven months. So how much did you make from that investment? Yeah. Enough to put me away for the rest of my life. Just like I made, you know, five to seven million dollars in a day in crypto, I've also lost a ton of money. Like how was the dropshipping journey, the e-commerce business? Generated over $2 million dollars revenue. How much was the entry fee for each person they had to pay? 15,000, cheap. I need to go do buggies. I need to go see some crazy shit. And they said, you're the man. There I was at the age of 16 with $200 that my parents gave me in a suitcase on my way to America alone. But when COVID rolled around, which was our first million dollar day. Million dollars in a day. Light work, I've done $5 million in a day. So when people say drop shipping is dead, drop shipping ain't dead. I calculate money by hour. How much you make per hour? My hour is valued at 2,500 to 20,000, depends on the day. You made your first million dollars a day on e-commerce. And how did that feel? Can I ask you how much money you have? Like, what's your net worth? Guys, it's possible. Like, you can do it. Welcome back to the show and thank you for returning back to the channel, the podcast where we talk about business, happiness, life, personal finance, advice. Luke Belmar. The man himself in the building. Hi, brother. A very special guest. Um, quickly, I want to just note something. You just came back from um, Capital Club. You just had a meet. It was in... Phuket, Thailand. Phuket, Thailand. Yeah. We, we tend to just travel different places around the world, unlock new data sets from different side quests that we so, endeavor on. Nice. And just uh, we got together with about 60 entrepreneurs. All right. And this is called the Capital the Club. Capital Club, yeah. So, 60... 60 people attended. 60 people attended because we have limited space and we're very selective as to who we invite. But currently we're represented in over 72 countries. Wow. And uh, currently all collectively we've uh, generated over 1.5 billion Damn. in sales. Like so, a private networking club. A private networking club. And that's what it is. It's a club. We don't, we're not in the business of education alone. We're not in the business of you know <laughs> people doing signals and all this garbage that you see people pulling out. We're in the business of elevating each other because as you said earlier today, the most important thing in business is your connections, it's your network. And that really shows the level of maturity that you've come to understand in business, right? At, at, an, at a young age, it's not about the hustle, it's not about the grind, that shit has to take place, but it's about the people in your network. So I'm in the you. business of, of building that army, brother. So 60 people, and how much was the entry fee for each person they had to pay? 15,000. $15,000. Cheap. Yeah, cheap. <laughs> cheap for, for the entrepreneurs that were there, obviously. No, cheap cheap, and, it, cheap is, is I evaluate in two ways. There's no such thing as something being expensive. There's only rich and poor, mm. right? So it's about where you are in your career. Yeah. If you're a brokey, our network isn't for you. How much are the people worth that are in the club? Millions. We just had a guy exit for 50 million, one of his software companies. Uh, so people just taking it to the next level. Seven to nine figure entrepreneurs. Damn. All right. Yeah. Let's give like a quick summary in case anyone who's watching this video for some reason does not know who this man is, Luke Belmar. Let's do a bit of a, maybe like a one minute intro about you, where you've come from, your life story, um, how you ma started making money, how you made all these millions. And let's let's talk about it. Absolutely, bro. So first of all, thanks for having me. No It's worries. a pleasure. You've, no, it's you've shown me a great me. time in Dubai. <laughs> Our boy connected us the other day on yeah. the DMs. And I was like, bro, I need to go do buggies. I need to go see some crazy shit. Tigers, lions. And they said, you're the man. So I was like, all right, let's run it up. So we have some crazy, uh, crazy vlog that's coming from on shit that channel. we filmed. Check that out. It's going to be fire. But thank you for welcoming me. No, of course. It's been thank a you. phenomenal experience and you've been a great host. Thank you so, so much for your time. Uh, I'm from Argentina. Okay. At the age of 16, my parents come from a very poor family. Uh, we lived in a small little village of like 18,000 people, about two hours away from Buenos Aires, the main city. And at the age of 16, I was tired, just saturated with this bullshit of working a job, following the career path that you were meant to follow. Because I realized one thing, bro, I realized all these people that are giving me advice, do I want to live the life that they live? And when the answer was no, then I wouldn't listen to them. So when my parents said, hey, you should do this, you should go to this university, you should go to this location, you should hang out with these people, you shouldn't say this or you shouldn't do that. And then I evaluated the outcome of their life as much as I love them. I was like, well, I don't want the life that my parents have. I want a different life. 
Therefore, I have to achieve different things and I have to input different results. And I have to do different uh, kind of measurements of business if I want to elevate. I can't be doing what my parents do. If my parents are doing 50K, 100K a month, I can't be capped by that mindset. I can't right. be capped by that information. So at the age of 16, uh, you moved to US. My uncle, in fact, was a pilot, is a pilot. And since we couldn't afford, you know, the ability to sit in a regular seat because I couldn't buy a ticket, my uncle let me sit in the flight attendant seat. So there I was at the age of 16 with $200 that my parents gave me in a suitcase on my way to America. Alone. So alone, alone. So I went from, you know, working, cleaning toilets, uh, power washing streets no to way. knocking doors, sleeping in my car, homeless, working at restaurants, washing dishes. What was your dishes. first job in the U.S.? My first job in the U.S. was pressure washing basketball courts. Wow. <laughs> that was my first job in America, bro. And then uh, cleaning toilets was my second job. Cleaning toilets. Yeah. You've it, cleaned toilets. Clean toilets. And there, we had, we, it was called co Code Brown or Code Black when a, when a toilet got clogged. So I started from the trenches and it was about 2015. I got introduced, long story short, to Bitcoin. Got introduced to crypto. But you started dropshipping before that? No, in fact, my first exposure to anything that came with money-making opportunities was in fact the markets. And then of course, you have a $25,000 threshold in order for you to day trade, right? Because America has this bullshit rule that you can only trade like three times every couple of days if you have a balance less than 25K because okay. they don't want people getting liquidated. So okay. like my first goal is how can I make 25K, right? To be in a situation where I can in fact they like day trade yeah. and I don't have to put a trade and swing it and wait for it. So I was like, I need to make more money. Right. So I started waiting tables, doing two, three jobs at a time, sleeping in my car, saving money because in the U S in many restaurants, you get paid your tips that same day. So what I would do is I would take the cash, right? I would go to Wells Fargo, the ATM in my car. I would deposit the money. It's so vivid in my mind. I would deposit the money. It would be instantly reflected the balance in my bank account. Yeah. And we would spend half of the budget buying crypto, right, on Bitstamp. And then the other half, we would it would be our advertising budget for Facebook ads for that day. So we were on a day-to-day -day um, basis. You, 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 were, you were selling something on Facebook? Correct. So we started drop shipping probably about six to seven months after I got exposed to the markets. We did extremely well 2019, 2020, made a couple million dollars, and then rolled over my entire net worth, every single penny of my net worth into crypto in 2020. In the crash of March, I remember we were playing Call of Duty. Yeah. I, I rented a villa in, in Miami while everybody was freaking the out about COVID. I was just chilling, making my money, making my moves. And I realized that this was my event to get rich. Mm -hmm. This was my moment. So I set all my buy orders on Bittrex and on Kraken. And I was buying order blocks of Ethereum, uh, $10,000 every order block at like $90 a piece. Yeah. And then we were buying Cardano at half a penny. Wow. <laughs> and my biggest play, of course, was, uh, which is what I'm most famous for, is PancakeSwap. Top, you're a top 10 holder in PancakeSwap. I was Swap. a top 10 holder. I owned 1% of the, not of the circulating supply, the whole supply of uh, PancakeSwap, even though it's they, the they continue adding tokens now. But I owned 1% of the supply, sub 50 cents or sub $25 million market cap, something ridiculous. And I rode that up to $2.6 billion market cap. So much so that I... Uh, tattooed it on my neck. So how much did you make from that investment? Millions. <laughs> that was it. It was a good opportunity. Yeah. A lot of money. Yeah. Enough to put me away for the rest of my life. Yeah. I, from that play alone, 30 years, I could live 30 years just from that. How much money was it? A lot. Like you care to see the amount? Over five. Over $5 million? Yeah. Nice. Amazing. And how much did you make from the drop shipping? Uh, generated over 16. $16 million revenue. Damn, that's crazy. Yeah, easy light work, bro. The goal is what people don't understand is that the goal in business is to make money, but then you got to multiply the money. Yeah. And it's easier to multiply it through investments and through high risk, high yield opportunities. Because when you're young, like we are, you can take risks. Yeah. You can do things that most people aren't willing to do. You you can, you can be aggressive. You don't you have can a be aggressive. to feed. Exactly. And that's what I did. I was aggressive. But just like I made, you know, five to seven million dollars in a day in crypto, which is where I made most of my money, I've also lost a ton of money, right? Because I realized that if you want to play big, right, and yeah. you want to make a lot of money, you have to be able to bet big as well. Yeah. And that's what people don't talk about. You see it on the news, you see it on, on Yahoo or CNBC, 
you see a fund lose $100 million or $200 million, and you don't actually think about how much money that actually is. Yeah. But that's a bet. That's a bet. So I came to realize I'm no longer in the business of doing bets for drop shipping. I'm no, no longer betting on $50 ad sets and shit of that nature. I'm here doing 10 million plus deals. That's the game that I'm in at this point. Because since you're expending the same amount of time and energy, might as well secure a bigger bag. 100%, yeah. No, definitely. We're gonna and we're gonna talk about all those crypto ventures. But <laughs> before we get into it, I want to talk a bit about the dropshipping days. Um, how long? Like, how's the dropshipping journey? The e-commerce business. When did you make your first money? Let's say your first million dollar month, or even went on to make your first million dollar day. Um, talk us through that. Two thousand. First of all, do you care to say what you were selling on? on oh yeah, I'll, I'll 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 tell you what my what like my biggest niche was. My biggest niche was home products. Mm. Why? Because I understood that I needed a few things in order to succeed in dropshipping. One is I needed an evergreen market. I needed to sell a product that wasn't a one-off. Mm. I did. I couldn't have one-time customers. Consumable. I needed repeat customers with long and high lifetime value retention. I needed my customers to be worth more than fourteen dollars mm. and spending a ton of money and paying Zuck to give me these customers because That's I understood great. how complicated it was going to be because the model was very simple, therefore it could be replicated. Yeah. So I was like, okay, let's make our money with drop shipping. It's really good, but also we need to be adapting on everything that's backend, our SMS flows, our email marketing, our ability to build a funnel of products based how, on- where, Where'd you learn all this stuff from? It, bro, it's all on the internet and it's logic. If you're thinking about a customer journey, right? Let's say you enter into my business. Yeah. A lot of this has to do with logic. People are like, oh, where, where did you learn this shit? Where did you read this? Sometimes you just have to sit down and analyze. Think. Sometimes you just have to sit down and think. Hmm. Most people don't think. They don't have any time to think. They're always scrolling away and they're- They they're, have time. They don't make it. Yeah. They don't make time to, they they don't don't make make time to think. And when you understand that thinking is actually a skill, you begin to develop it. Yeah. How thinking think? is a skill set. I spent, in fact, it was about eight to 12 months sitting around a fire. Literally, it was my job to sit around the fire and we were just masterminding. I would bring different people into my house. I would come spend a few weeks with us and we literally sit down and mastermind. I didn't make money for those that period of time. We were making you know, 100, 200K a month, light work, but I spent my entire time developing how to think. Mm. And what I realized is with drop shipping specifically is that in order for you to have a winning niche, you need a couple things. The first one is an evergreen ecosystem, your ability to continuously sell in perpetuity. Okay. The second thing is you need a big enough audience. Okay. So your pool of customers, yeah. if you're trying to scale to a million dollar day, you can't have a $200,000, a 200,000 person audience. You need a big market. You need a big market. Target the masses. So that's why I was like, okay, let me sell household products mm. because every Everybody person is going to need this in perpetuity, always and forever. 100%. And then finally, I was like, I need to make sure because a lot of people drop ship and they try to finesse Facebook. Mm -hmm. I'm like, dude, I'm not in the business of finessing Facebook. I want to have a good relationship with Facebook. Yeah. They are giving me the ability to advertise. I want a good relationship. Yeah, you can't bite so, the hand that feeds you. Exactly. So I built uh, good relationships with reps. I had good ad credits. Mm -hmm. And what I came to realize is I can actually still succeed and follow their terms and conditions. So when COVID rolled around, which was our first kind of like million dollar day, was million dollars in a day light work i've done five million dollars in a day profit it's nothing bro what you're looking at here dubai what i'm doing is pennies do you can dubai these mother printing a billion dollars a day so when all these kids on the internet they're like oh five million dollars there's no way dude you have no <laughs> idea the level of wealth there is out there and your peewee brain can't get it it's okay so five million dollars is chump change i see it as a stepping stone to what we're going to be doing in the future so a lot of people are like, oh, $5 million, show the receipts. Bro, my is out here doing a billion a day. And the receipts are there because they've seen your projects. Oh yeah, you can see the projects. You can literally go on my highlights where I'm literally telling my to literally buy every single thing that I bought. I told people to literally buy Board Ape Yacht Club at Fort ETH where I was literally buying them up. People didn't listen. I told people to cash out of crypto at $4,000 in ETH. I sold all my ETH at $3,950. Damn. Every single penny of it. I've order blocks on my Binance that show million to $2 million sales at that price. Most people were greedy at the time. They wanted most, to hold for more. Most people are gambling. Mm. Most, people, most people don't understand that the goal is to, to uh, accumulate wins. It's compounding wins that matter. It's not this idea of- One big massive one win. One big win, dude. I'm in the business of big wins now 
But when I started off, I wasn't in the business of a big win. I needed consecutive wins. Why? I needed to build up my self-esteem. I needed to build up my dubs and I needed to build up the confidence that I could actually do bigger deals. Yeah. So anyways, so then the final aspect of this dropshipping ecosystem was, like I said, having a good relationship with Facebook and having a good relationship with the advertising platforms and making sure that you can follow the rules and you can succeed that way. Why? Because they will push your stuff if your content and your product and your ad is good, right? Because yeah. they don't, if they're pulling people out of the platform, they want to make sure that the customer is having a good experience. Right. Otherwise, it's, it's their, their, exactly. their, their customer. Attention. So when COVID rolled around and they were, they banned masks and they banned uh, hand sanitizers because like going super hard and super greedy and charging four or five X and scamming people. I said, hmm, maybe instead of selling it to people, which was banned, I sell it to animals. So I started selling, you know, these health products and these sanitation products, but it was niche to pets. Huh. And that was not circumventing the policy. Therefore we had crazy viral ads because the fear was the same. You just redirected, right? Yeah. To a different, a different scenario. So we, I think we had the top 10 ad of Facebook, top 10 or top 20 of all time. I think it had over 250 million views wow. on the ad. How much did you spend for that ad? <sighs> Millions of dollars, bro. Because it was over months. So what exactly is the product? Like, what? I can't say exactly the product because it still works. Ah, I can't okay. tell you what the product is, but I've given you the niche, right? Which is household products. And I've told you that we niched it to pets. To pets. Sanitation products for pets. Sanitation products for pets. We repurposed it. Mm. So that's how we operated it. And it works super well. I'll give all the drop shippers in the e-commerce uh, kids a little freebie. Yeah. Um, what really helped us in our ecosystem and our ability to, because your ad is an ecosystem. It's not just a placement. That's what people don't understand. Your ad is designed, right? By nature to just be in front of people. Then what the ad actually is in yeah. the ecosystem that you build around the ad begins to kick in. What do I mean by this? That there's multiple things inside your ad that people don't take into account that if you take into account, you're gonna reduce your CPMs, you're gonna increase your conversions, and you're gonna make sure that you're saving money in advertising. What is this? A few things, you have your copy, you have your creative, you have your comment section, you have your customers, you have the, your viewers, and you have your retargeting. That's your like variables. Most people only look at their creative and only look copy. at their copy. Yeah, That's it. Nobody looks at the comment section. Mm. So what did we do? We began treating the comment section, understanding that if people commented in They're the comment interested. section, Facebook would trigger it Boost as people post. being interested, therefore boosting the post and reducing our CPM. Engagement, yeah. So what would we do? We engagement farmed real conversations like a Reddit forum. Mm. So what would happen? Lady A would hop into our ad, right? Yeah. And she would be in a scenario where we're like, oh, this is a cool product. It would be nice for my dog. Mm. Most would go on the drop shipping a comment, right? And be like, oh, well, that's cool. You can get it for 50% off. Here's the link. Yeah. What did we do? Cultivate relationships with customers. Oh, that's great. Do you mind sharing a photo of your dog? Mm. Boom. Next person, that's a cute dog. Oh, perfect. Do you have a dog? Please post a photo of your dog. Then we would co trigger controversy. So we would have an account that would go be like, I don't like that dog. <laughs> it's an ugly dog. It's an ugly dog. And people would go crazy yeah. and comment, but, Don't Facebook, call my dog ugly. but Facebook doesn't know the difference. Therefore, we began to have extremely cheap CPMs, massively cheap CPMs that we'd never seen before. CPMs for the people that don't know what that is, yeah. CPM, that's cost, cost per, per thousand mil it's in Spanish or in Latin, cost per thousand. So we were able to reduce that, I think by 160X. Because for Facebook, they want let to- me, let, me, let, me, let me say that again. Go for it. We were able to reduce, based off of that strategy that I just told you guys, our advertising cost by 160 X. And it's so simple. Our shit was so clean, dude. That's how these, so when people say drop shipping is dead, drop shipping ain't dead. Your ability to market and your ability to move and redevelop and reinvent your strategies is dead. Mm. What used to work no longer works. Yeah. But drop shipping is gonna be around for the next couple hundred years. How it looks like, how it's formatted is different. People have been drop shipping for thousands of years. What is drop shipping? Your ability to arbitrage a, pro a product that you've never seen. We just started using Shopify on the internet. Before it used to be QVC, yeah. and it used to be the shit that you would see online. And it's gonna be the next thing in the next time, yeah. right? So 
the model will exist in perpetuity. How the model is expressed the technology. will change. The technology. And that's will, where uh, you have to adapt. Yeah. So if people are like, oh, Facebook is <laughs> Oh, my ads are shit. Oh, Shop drop shipping is dead. Yeah. Oh, my PayPal. tracking pixel is terrible. I can't process payments. Those are all excuses. And excuses are for fucking losers. You have to adapt. Uh, exactly. You adapt or you die. Yeah. Sink or swim. Yeah, exactly. No, very true. That's crazy, actually. And uh, the success you've had on e-commerce is definitely something that we can't move past without without acknowledging, you know? Because uh, a lot of people, it's it's like probably one of the most competitive spaces. For everybody, sure. it's the number one side hustle that everybody wants to do, drop shipping. you but know? But that's the problem, bro. They treat it as a hustle. Mm. And there's two types of minds yeah. in this space. Because I do, I, do, I do business with they are out here doing million dollar days, 100 million a year in, in drop shipping. Like raw general store drop shipping. These Asians, they ain't treating this shit like a hustle. They're bosses. They run this like a business. Corporation. Like a corporation. That's Empire. why they're schooling you. That's why your shit ain't working. Cause these guys are taking your ads. These guys are taking your products. They have better supply chains. They have better price cogs. Like they're, they're schooling you on every department cause you're treating it like a side hustle. Side hustles, what I learned in the beginning of my career should only be the mentality applied to making your initial money. Yeah, 100%. Once you I agree. go from hustle mode, you need to go to boss mode. Yeah. What is boss mode? A person that is building long-term sustainable businesses. You cannot build long-term scalable businesses by having to force cram and force feed ads in order for your business to survive. It won't work that way. It's too annoying. It's too stressful. I don't wanna rely on Zuck's algos and on Zuck's tracking in order for me to make money. Yeah. Why? Because as soon as Apple comes around and says, you're tracking, we're canceling that shit. Now Facebook goes to shit, right? So you can't be dependent on one single avenue. It's not going to work. So people need to start shifting their mindset. Once you, once you have your first 100K, dude, your mindset should shift from hustle to boss. 100%, I agree. You know, there's a good quote. Uh, it says, they, they say, Mark Zuckerberg wasn't flipping Airbnbs when he was building Facebook. He was <laughs> focusing his time on building Facebook. He didn't have any of these side hustles. And some of these side hustles, it's good in the beginning when you want to learn what you want to do, do many and things. He's, yeah. And he's in a scenario where instead of him making money, which he would i had already done, uh, he comes from a family that was decent, he raised money, Yeah. right? Your goal is to not have to worry about money. Whatever way you achieve that, whether your parents give you the money, whether you make your own money like we did, whether you fundraise, whatever it is, right? You need to be able to not worry about money so that you can focus on building. Not hustling, dude. Hustling is cool when you're a brokey. Yeah. But when you have money, dude, the hustle mentality is gonna keep you behind. People tell me, look, how much money do you make in a day? I don't calculate money by day. I calculate money by hour. <laughs> how much do you make per hour? How much, my hour is valued at 2,500 to 20,000, depends on the day. That's what my I, that's what I value my hour at. Yeah. So I will not touch a task under. So this two hour is worth twenty five thousand. <laughs> at, at, at a minimum, for example, if you want to make a million dollars a year, right, yeah. which is your you should be your base goal, yeah. because nowadays your real million dollars is three million, based off of inflation, inflation based off of the bullshit, yeah. based off of the amount of money that's being printed. <laughs> Potentially, so you're in a situation where now you have a little bit of money. You got to be operating differently, dude. People need to be focused on elevating themselves. And the way that you do it is when money is no longer your main focus, your focus is building. Mm. Now, drop shipping, e-commerce, social media marketing, whatever it may be, gives you the avenue and the ability to learn and make the mistakes yeah. in an easy way where you don't have an organization, where you don't have venture capital, where you don't have investors that you have to keep happy. You learn the mistakes while still making money. That's the beauty of the 21st century. That's the beauty of 2023 is that you can actually still make money. Yeah. Whereas back in the day, it was a little bit more difficult. The barrier to entry was higher. Yeah. But on the other side, the barrier to entry today also means that there's competition. more comp comp competition. 100%. So how do you beat them? How do you beat them? You're not a hustler. You're a business owner. Mm. That's the difference. A lot of these kids, they don't know shit about business, dude. They know how to make money. They know how to market. Buying but stuff. business is a multidisciplinary skill. Business is a multidisciplinary skill. How to build teams, how to become a leader, how to incentivize your people, logistics, warehouse, mm. customer service, product development, cogs, finance, Damn. taxes. Dude, the list goes 
on yeah. in forever. And, I t and, do, and I've done it, right? I've taught people about payment processing. I've taught people about products. I've taught people about anthropology of consumerism, yeah. how people think. I've taught people these things that are evergreen kind of ecosystems and concepts because this idea of like, well, what Facebook ad are you using right now? How many ad sets are you running? What's your ad spend for your testing? Yeah. These are all tactics. The question is, why do those things work? Yeah, what's the method? Like, what's the what's the what's the mindset? The that's strategy, that? yeah. the strategy, dude. And once you have the strategy down, you just have to replicate it in other niches. Yeah, that's it. You can take that and use it anywhere. Correct, Apply dude. It anywhere. Look, look how many people in that were doing e-commerce and social media marketing, got into crypto, got into NFTs, and did well. Why? Because they had those skills that they had previously developed that are multidisciplinary. Right. I like to call them interlinked. There, there are niches, there's skills that you need to learn as an individual that cross pollinate into different ecosystems. What are a few of these skills that always keep you rich? Your ability to sell? Yeah. <laughs> if you know how to Most sell, you'll be rich every day because you can make money. Yeah, you can be in the desert, you'll take anything. Your ability to network? Yeah. Your ability make to be in the room and your understanding of current market trends and current market conditions, understanding what is the current framework of the world. Because a lot of people look at a framework, the framework stops working, right? Or the ecosystem kind of that they built doesn't function anymore in the current world. Yeah. They get frustrated yeah. and they want to go do something else. Instead of taking what they are already doing, kind of like a football match. If you look at, uh, if you look at Argentina and France, yeah. the final, shout out Argentina. Uh, Where are you from? <laughs> halfway through their strategy, right? Or halfway through the game, they had to adapt the strategy. 100%, yeah. Because they realized, oh shit, they, the French caught on to a little bit of what we were doing. We got to replace some players. Yeah. And that's sometimes what you got to do in your organization. You got to recalibrate. You got to rethink. Not throw the entire thing out. Not let me go start something new. No. Find those multidisciplinary skills yeah. that you're good at. Yeah harness those and then just develop people, people these days they have shiny object syndrome it's like they see it's the bad dude fashion. it's bad dude it's see bad. nfts they want to run to that they see crypto they want to run to that they see dropshipping they want to drop servicing then there's this people every, want fast money yeah and it's what i was going to tell you based off of value my hour i'm in a situation i'm in a situation right now g where i'm not in the business of making money every day oh, 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 oh my gosh it's crazy no i'm in the business of <laughs> big deals yeah I'll give you an example. Most people are like, oh, dude, if I could make $10,000 net profit a day, do the math, oh, that's 300K a month. Perfect, that's good. so good. Dude, I don't give a fuck about the 10 Gs a day. Give me a $10 million contract every four months. That's you know? what I'm interested in. That's it. Give me a $10 million net profit contract every four months, five months. Let me work towards that for five months, then I cash in my check. And the reason I realized this is what we were talking about. People hate the middleman yeah people say they people shit on the middleman the guy that yeah. understands how to connect opportunity and i told them about uh i told you today earlier about the Amazon story middleman, yeah the dude middlemen are the best airbnb dude. they're the best airbnb facebook. uber all middlemen facebook yeah they're just platformed yeah but if it wasn't a platform, it'd be a person because back in the day you had tourism kind of guys right. that would book your shit travel you agencies travel agencies things of this nature so i was like this dude, I was like, I'll give you a scenario. There's a guy that uh, lived in Port that lived in Puerto Rico. He already left. Uh, his uh, I'll call him Jay, and Jay was able to arbitrage a relationship between uh, South Korean mask manufacturers and one of the biggest hospitals in New York City. Mm -hmm. And what did he do? He just connected the head of the hospital in New York City and connected the head of factory. the Korean factory, That's and he right. just cashed in a check. And what were they shipping? Five containers of masks every single day. He received $20,000 commission per container per day. He was making $100,000 net profit a day. Knew nothing. For over a year and a half by connecting people. I'm in the business of deals. I'm in the business of how much can I receive, energy can I receive with the least amount of energy output? Because yeah. I understand that a genius Scout. Your energy is kept. A genius isn't a person that does everything. A genius is a person that does the right things, the right. necessary things, conserving energy, playing the game right. Why? Because if you understand that everything's energy, because everything is energy, whether it's money, whether it's relationships, everything transmutes the energy, your goal is to conserve your energy as yeah. much as possible. So once I realized that my boy was out here making 100K a day connecting people, I was like, dude, I'm no longer in the business 
of this fast money. Yeah. I'm in the business of, dude, give me a $10 million deal every five months. Mm. Let me build the deal. I already have money, I can be patient. Now I'm not, I'm not in the business of hustling and spraying bullets with my M16. Let me sit in the tree, calculate the air, calculate the air pressure. At the chessboard. <laughs> pull back my sniper rifle, just one shot. One shot. I'll wait. Yeah. I'm at the point in my career, G, where I just have to double my money every year and I'm chilling. Yeah. I don't have to go make all this bullshit, like scenarios, hustling. And it's a different scenario, situation for a lot of people. No, we have a lot of young listeners. But what I'm trying to do is condition people's mind ahead of time because they need to get educated. You know, that's why I talk about the importance of books. That's why I talk about the importance of networks. That's why I talk about the importance of self-education. It's extremely important because it's not currently just where you are, but you need to have a plan as to where you're going. And most of your plans should come from understanding that there's a list of ingredients and formulas that other people leave clues to success, many that are written down that you need to build off of. Yeah. So hustle, make your initial money, but then go from hustler to boss. It's the name of the game. Damn, and how was that feeling? Like, I wanna, I wanna just quickly talk about that feeling when you realize that, let's say like, okay, you were cleaning toilets, you know, life was so bad. And so two things, like the f how you made your first big money. I, I, never said, I, never, I never said life was bad. No, you didn't say it, yeah. Life was but amazing. Was <laughs> you know why? When you were cleaning the toilets. You know what, what, you know why life was amazing? What? Because there was hope. Hope, yeah. And hope is is what allows you to push forward positivity. You were talking about, I was asking you today, a book that you liked, that you've been reading lately, you said The, the Magic of Thinking just Big. Just it, yeah. It's amazing, yeah. right? So I had the magic of thinking big. I was just doing what I needed to do in order to get to the next level. Just like today, in 10 years, dude, in 10 years, I don't wanna be traveling first class. In 10 years, I wanna be traveling private jet. Your own jet. In 10 years, I don't wanna be in a scenario where I'm networking with guys that are making $500,000 a year. I want to be working with guys that make $50 million a year. I'm not going to shit on what I used to do. It's part of the journey, True, brother. Yeah. So it's, it's like, the man you were. dude, I was happy. I've been happy the entire journey. Damn. Yeah, but how, how was the feeling of you making your first, like that big money? How'd you make it? And how was the life change? So the first big money was e commerce. Yeah. And it was my first six figure day. I was like, it's possible. You made $100,000 in a 110, day? 110,000. 110. And I was like, it's possible. It opened it's your mind. It possible, unlocked. the guys. It's possible. Like you can do it. And right now, you have a you have this little whisper in your brain that's like, no, you can't do it. No, you can't do it. No, no, no. It's not possible. But what if that's all off. the programming in your mind from all the years of bullshit and programming that you've gone through? And in reality, it is possible. What's the difference between you and all the billionaires and the children of billionaires? Why is it that these kids can go and do a hundred million dollar deal and not sweat? and not bad an eye. Cause it's, it's no, all no, about no. mindset. It's all about your education. They realize they're f***ing It's nothing, money's an illusion, money isn't real. So when you understand the whole paradigm, you no longer treat your pursuit of business, your pursuit of your career, your pursuit of success as a job, as a burden. What do you look at it as? A privilege. Yeah, Dude, most people wouldn't have the opportunity to clean toilets as a stepping stone to becoming a millionaire. Most people clean toilets for their entire f***ing True. So I was like, it's a stepping stone, dude. I did it with a smile and I did it well. Nice. <laughs> Sick. And then you made your first uh, million dollars a day on e-commerce. And how did that feel? Like, did you, and Nothing. What did you celebrate it? Nothing. I celebrated with two pizzas and a pool party <laughs> with, my, with my family, just hanging out Yeah. back in the day. Chilling, G. I'm, I'm in the mission right now. It ain't a, it, money does not make me, bro. Money does not make me. And I say this as a guy that has a lot of money, so it sounds hypocritical for a person that doesn't have money. Like, ah, oh, this guy- Can is, I ask you how much money you have? Like, what's your net worth? I'm not gonna tell you. Yeah. No chance. <laughs> uh, Around. No chance. Uh, that's one of those things where I will never disclose how much I'm worth. It's impossible. Fair enough. Impossible. My impossible. I try to check online. To There's not even a number. <laughs> you're Most not going to find, find anything, some dude. type of number that I you're, can shoot at them. But yeah, this, you, no you're number. not going to find anything. And the reason you're not going to find anything is because I've learned a lot about how Asians move with yeah. regards to money. Money is, this is how Asians think about it, especially in the Chinese culture. That's why they're very secretive about money is money's energy. Yeah. And the moment you begin to expose that energy, right? people start to understand how powerful or how weak you truly are. Mm -hmm. So numbers, will keep them private. Let's just leave actions to speak for themselves. Nice, yeah. That's no, the name of the enough. game. You guys will see it.
Give me a year. And you deleted all your, like, you know, a lot of the stuff online about you is not there anymore. And I know as well, you deleted a lot of your videos on YouTube. Absolutely. So why why have you left so less social presence? Why have you deleted so much of your videos? Because... You told me now you have 30 podcasts you've never released. Yeah, I have 30 podcasts that I filmed. I've never released them, never will release them uh, because it's too much value, Mm -hmm. too much sauce. And sometimes just people don't deserve it. Mm-hmm. You have this idea that people, people on online, they think, they think that they, de- you don't deserve shit. <laughs> Nothing. Do you get that? Nothing. You don't, you don't deserve this podcast. You don't deserve us sitting here. You don't deserve us taking an hour and a half of our time to be here with you. You don't deserve it. We're doing it because we care. We're doing it because we want to. So when I was like, dude, I'm dropping so much sauce. People don't deserve this. I'll keep this for my, my capital club community. I'll keep this private. I'll keep it for the club. So I just decided to delete it, and hopefully, uh, hopefully it stays deleted. I know some people were able to find some files and shit on the internet. You know, it it's always, all over TikTok. It, it, it's people find it, dude. People find it and repost that shit. That's totally fine. But I came to realize, dude, um, people it are entitled. People, though. people are entitled. People yeah. are entitled, and I'm no longer in the business of serving entitled people. I'm in the business of serving people Committed. that are ready to be unplugged and good people, dude. People that don't take shit for granted. You know, you know when I realized this and it really like hit me was uh, when there was different people that got banned you know, over the last two years, multiple people. And their community didn't give a They got banned, they're like, ah, he's banned. On to the next person, on to the next piece of entertainment, on to the next podcast, on the next piece of value. Everybody's just parasite, parasite, parasite of value, parasite of value, parasite bandwagon. of value. Jumping on the bandwagon. So I'm no longer in the business of serving these people. Yeah. And that's a, that ha- just happens to be a portion of the community. And you know, I'm in the business right now of taking care of the club, taking care of my friends, taking care of my family. And that means sometimes you gotta limit the information, what you give to people, and you have to limit kind of uh, the exposure that you have. Because at the end of the day, once it's on the internet, it's always on the internet. And you just have to be careful. Like net worth you know you never know when the irs comes knocking true very you never true. know when <laughs> you never know when these situations happen so you yeah. got to be in a situation where you protect yourself if elon musk doesn't ex- ex- uh Explosive disclose interest. how yeah. much he's worth why would i yeah 100 percent. i don't have to be a billionaire you to disclose to. that it's a principle so we operate b- based off of those principles if you guys look up the net worth of the royal family here that to me is probably one of the most outstanding families uh of to ever. ever to ever do it they literally built this entire sand hill into an absolute utopia. It's absolutely bananas. Um, yep. and, and you look at their net worth on Forbes and it says $2 billion. <laughs> Motherfuckers make $2 billion a day. <laughs> you have no idea. These people are sitting on trillions, trillions of dollars, liquid, whether it's in cash or in liquid uh, petroleum, black gold. They're sitting on trillions of dollars. Real wealth shuts up yeah they say coins make 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 noise but real cash it's quiet and um you you spoke uh, briefly about books and the importance of books and we had andrew on this podcast one of your friends very close friends you've done a lot of work with him andrew's great and he he said that he doesn't find books to be useful at all what's your take on books so they may not be useful for him right but they may be useful for other people and you know, I'm in the situation right now where I don't like to make blanket statements like saying books are not useful yeah. because there's 7.5 billion people on the planet and books are useful, right? They're just useful in its right context. Okay. You do not want to be an academic type individual, which is what I think Tate refers to is you don't want to be the type of person that just consumes information. Self-help junkie. Correct. <laughs> it's all like mental masturbation. Yeah. It's all this like, let me stimulate my mind, but have no action. Let me feel productive without doing anything. Tate is an action type of guy. Yeah. And then I've seen him, I've been at his home, the dude's always hustling. So to him, dude's intelligent, he may not need books, right? Because he understands where he's going. For me, on the other hand, is I understood a certain principle of the nature of books. Can I share it with you? Sure. So when you read um, words, words yeah. are symbols, they're letters to express what? A thought. Thoughts. Thoughts are energy. So what you're doing when you're reading a book is you are extracting the thought and the energy of the author while reading that book. So the question is, what type of energy and thoughts am I trying to extract? Why is this person writing this? I would be a fool with all the wisdom that's out there to not consume it. I'd be a fool. 
Now, it may not be applicable to other individuals, but it's highly applicable for me because of kind of how I move, right? So right now, my big thing, right, where I play most of my, my cards is private equity. Yeah. In order for me to become a master at private equity, it requires a lot of education, 100%. study, formal study. Like I have to get in there and understand how this shit works, right? You can't just be like, oh, let me toss money here. Let me toss money here. No, let me no. manage it's my like investments. You got to get educated. And the education just happens to be in the books. You can be like, oh, I'm gonna learn private equity on YouTube. That just happens to be another format of education. But at the end of the day, most billionaires aren't, aren't out here posting on YouTube. Most billionaires write their memoirs, they That's drop true. some sauce, and then they kind of operate. So I, I'd like to read a book every three days, book every four days. Wow. So it's, I, it's only 100 pages a day if you think about it. It's not that how much. How long does that take you? How many hours do you spend a day reading? It's 100 pages a day. How so if hours? you think about 100 pages, you read a page every minute spend two hours two hours yeah it's and it's bad. crazy because warren buffett talks about this a lot like you see like people want to be successful look at the life of warren buffett he spends like you know a couple hours a day i think reading and people are like you know like people will be like no you have to be like working but he's just educating himself learning. because he is working yeah he's just working a different muscle he's just working in a different way he's no longer hustling he's a boss he's a boss he will have people work for him if you look at the crown prince the crown prince is making decisions his job is to think <laughs> yeah his job is to use this his job isn't to his job is to do this that's who he is so i'm a, I'm, a, I'm on boss mode i'm not on hustle mode this means i need to develop this and i'd be utilizing my brain and my brain becomes highly stimulated when i start operating and realizing that the energy that's transmitted through these words is the energy and the thought that was captured by really successful people dude there's billionaires that are out here dropping game, game. You'd be a fool, a fool not to pick that up. 100%, that makes a lot of sense. And um, you, we wanna talk about now, um, ha about happiness for a bit. Hmm. Um, I know that you're a very happy person and you've always been happy. Do you think happiness is something that you can kind of, um, because I've, I've talked to some people and they tell me that happiness is just a byproduct of growth. Is happiness something that you can like target? Like, uh, is happiness something that you can index for and aim to have, or is it just something that happens along the way? You know what I mean? Yeah. So I, I would say we let's talk about the physical and the metaphysical. Okay. So let's talk about the physical. You can biochemically become happy. There's a chemical in your body known as serotonin. It's known as the happy yeah. chemical. Most of the serotonin in your body is produced here in your gut. So when you hear things like people saying trust your gut yeah. they don't stop to think what does that mean to trust your gut your gut yeah, operates gut. your gut operates as a brain right so the serotonin that's formed mm. inside of your gut is produced by what having a healthy gut mm. how do you have a healthy diet. gut diet by having a healthy diet nutrition so most of the serotonin is produced in the gut that produces happiness by what having a healthy diet, diet. yeah so most of you guys would automatically be a lot healthier and happier <laughs> had you Not instilled the ability of having a good diet equating to what? A good gut. That is on the physical side. On the metaphysical side is understanding the beauty and the privilege of the struggle of life. Understanding that you're not here to be happy. You're here to live life. You're here to experience suffering. You're here to experience tribulation. Yeah. You're here to hurt. You're here to experience heartbreak, pain, joy, pleasure, every single avenue, every single emotion. Why would you limit yourself from experiencing that? Why? Because you're scared. You're afraid. You don't know how it's going to work out. It doesn't feel good. Perfectly fine. But, but I've come to understand, I've come to realize that the beauty of life isn't in pursuing happiness. It's in pursuing experiences and it's understanding that it's multidisciplinary, it's multilateral, it's not just one emotion. So I'm not in the business of pursuing happiness, I'm in the business of pursuing life. And life comes in different forms at different seasons. You just have to enjoy it all. Live all of the it, ups dude. And downs. You just have, that's, that's, why, that's why the Bible says, you know, bear all things with joy. What does that mean? Is that anything that comes your way, bear it with joy, mm. be happy, be glad. Be grateful. Be grateful. It could be a lot be worse. Great. You could not be alive. You could be dead. It could be a lot worse. You could be in a shitty situation. Most of the complaints and bullshit that I hear from people is, oh, dude, I'm making 5K a month. Life sucks. Dude, let me take you to Malia. 
That's where these guys are literally having to scavenge, having to pirate, having Honestly. to do all this bullshit. Let me I've take you to Southeast Asia where these are working for a dollar a day. Let me take you to the lithium and mines way, in happy. Africa. No, some of the kids in Africa, I met 100%. them. They have nothing, but they're happier than me and you combined. 100%. Because you know why? Their, their, their baseline, that we have these big expectations of what we need to be happy. And for them, a simple broken or like, let's say, not inflated football is like the biggest blessing. They look at that football and they're like, wow, this is like so much fun. And they just need simple things, the simple things like sitting down with them, with their friends. That's all, that's what their life is. I've, I've come to realize that a lot of unhappiness- We have too much desires. A lot of unhappiness comes from uh, complicating things, complicating life, the simplicity mm -hmm. of life. For some reason, bro, humans are like the only species that are like been out of sync. If you look at every other animal, they're doing what they're supposed to do. Yeah, We're the only ones out here buying, fucking designer, spending all our money on this shit, trying to impress people, like our lives, buying 30 homes, like what are you trying to do, bro? Like live your life, relax a little bit, dude. You have no nothing to prove. Not, no company that you build today is going to last. Nothing that you put out is going to live forever. No money that you have is going to be around forever. You don't own anything. Dude, you, you don't own tonight. shit. So when people come to me with all this fear and this anxiety of not having or not having accomplished, yeah. is somehow they have no understanding of the, the finite Macro. nature, the finite nature of life, dude. You're here today, you're gone tomorrow. Make some impact, leave the world better than you left it, than you found it. Make sure that you love God, put others first. And it's a good way to start. Yeah, that's the way of life, I guess. I'm gonna ask you some quick, quick fire questions. Let's do it. One, one minute per question. All right. Okay. What would you tell 19 year old version of Luke Belmore if you had the chance? If you could speak to small Luke Belmore, 19 year old, what would you tell him? You're 27 now, yeah. 26. 26. What would I tell Luke Belmore if he was 19? That it's possible. Mm. That you can do it. Whatever you want in life, you can have. Yeah. But you're going to have to pay. The price. The price. Damn, that's true. Nice, all right. What's one lesson which you wish you lear would have learned sooner in life? That the most important thing is the development of yourself. Most people focus on one lane. They focus on money, or they focus on health, or they focus on relationships. They never focus on truly becoming wealthy. Wealth, by definition, I've said this before and I'll say it again, is abundance. That is what you want in life, abundance, making sure that you are complete. Had I learned this before, my health would have been in check earlier. My relationships would have been in check earlier. I said this to you before, and I said this to you at lunch. I said, everybody says that being a billionaire is stressful. Being a billionaire is hard. Yeah. Being a billionaire requires sacrificing every other area, in your, every other area of your life. Why? Why can, fat. <laughs> yeah, but why, why can't I do it a different way? Yeah. Why can't I be happy to the billion? Yeah. Why do I have to compromise my family to get to a billion? Why do I have to compromise my morality or my spirituality to get to a billion? Why do I have to compromise my health? That. I'm taking it all. I'm gonna build a life of balance, true wealth. Had I learned a lesson before, I would have potentially built a, a more dynamic lifestyle that allowed me to, I would say, be more well-rounded. Mm. And it's something that I had to develop and focus on later on in my life, in my, in my later 20s. But yeah, a lot of people are focused on one lane, one lane only. And once they master that lane, then they realize, oh shit, like I have neglected all of these things in my life. So I have to take retroactive steps, go all the way back yeah. to continue pushing. Damn. Instead of building slowly, slowly every area yeah. of your life. True wealth is what matters. I wish I would have learned that lesson a little bit earlier. And you know, hopefully people but it's okay. <laughs> learn a thing know. or two, G. Yeah, yeah. definitely. Um, do you ever wake up one day and just like not feel like doing anything? Like you just don't want to work, you just not, not don't want to Of course. Yeah. 100%, every person, dude. Yeah. Every person. Doesn't mean you don't do it. You just push yourself. It's not even pushing it, I guess yourself. it's easy to work hard when you have the motivation. It's, the, it's those days that you actually have to test it's, yourself. And, and that's the thing is like, if you're not motivated, yeah. it's for a few reasons. Either you don't like what you're doing, Either you don't understand the mission as to why you're doing something. Dude, if your family's starving, if you have to feed your kids. You'll work hard. Dude, you'll get your you'll get shit done. Most of you guys are comfortable. Yeah, they don't want it enough. Soft. 
They yeah. don't want it. You don't want it, dude. If you want it, you get up and do it. You do the things that you want to do. You put time into the things that you want to put time into. It was funny because today I told you, you asked me if how much I read. You asked me, do I read a lot? I was like, not as much as I want to. And you were like, no, you read exactly how much you want to. And I was like, what? And I, I was like, oh yeah. If I wanted to, if I wanted enough, I would have read way more than, I, than I've read. That's correct. And that's interesting because people, people, they act like they have to, like they don't have that choice sometimes. Sometimes you feel like you don't have that choice. Everything is a choice, G. Everything. Everything is a choice. The life that you have is the life that you chose. You have to live purposefully. The people life, are just going with the flow. The life that you have is a life that you chose. Exactly, yeah, it's true. Where you're currently living, what you're currently doing, you chose that. You have, like, you have people complain about having kids, people complain about having responsibilities, people complain about their rent, people complain about their student loans. Most of these things in life are self-imposed. Yeah, 100%. You self-impose all, these, all, these, all this bullshit. You self-impose a lot of these issues in your life. That's just the nature of the, of the game. So when you understand that everything is self-imposed, then you're like, okay, I'm gonna be a little bit more relaxed on my responsibilities. I'm gonna be more careful about the decisions and the commitments that I make because I understand that there's long-term consequences to it. I see a lot of people complaining, dude, but very few people taking 100%. action. Yeah. And Most people make excuses. Very few people make moves. Move, exactly, 100%. And sometimes there are circumstances like that life brings to you, but these ones you have to take, you, you can't spend your time complaining about those circumstances that you're in. The only thing you can do is look at the cards that life has given you and play those in the best way you can. Complaining is a loser's trait. Yeah. Complaining is the trait of a person that sees no hope to win. That's the name of the game, bro. That's, that, that's, those are the people that I see complaining. It's the people that have time to look at another person. It's like when people hate in the comments. Yeah. You know, for example, I was in a, we're here in, a, in Dubai right now. Somebody who's kind enough to, to, to lend me their McLaren uh, for the weekend. And then somebody commented on my shit. It was like, rented. Okay, nice. And <laughs> where am I and where are you? <laughs> like, what do you want me to tell you, G? To f <laughs> Instead of being like rented, be like, damn, how could I be in Dubai yeah. with Luke Belmar? I, mean, I gotta get to work rented that's what i was it thinking. could be rented it could be leased it could be owned the principle doesn't matter the principle is that you're expending energy on nonsense that's the message that you choose to send to a person with tens that's that's the message that you choose to send the person instead of being like hey here's a piece of value like you did hey let me take you out let me show you around let, yeah. me, let me elevate with you start changing the paradigm of your it's the yeah. name of the game bro 23 boys let's it's time to wake up wake the up bro enough with the bullshit enough with the excuses enough with the nonsense enough with being in a situation where you're always complaining where you're always pointing fingers point the fingers at yourself the life that you have is the life that you chose if you don't like the life that you have it's your damn fault dude change make different decisions hang out with different people and still some discipline some habits win Honestly, yeah, you're 100 percent right. Uh, do you feel like you're a lot of you're you're much older than the people in this space in terms of like that make content about, let's say, self development and stuff? Do you feel like you're a bit of one of the older guys in the space? Yeah, so you have like the younger crew, you yeah. know, you have like the the younger guys, you have Seb and things of this nature. He's a, he's a good buddy of mine. Then you have the older guys, you have Andrew and things of this nature. And then I kind of fall fall in the in the gap in between, right? Yeah. So I'm no longer in the early stage of my career. And at the same time, I'm not in my late 30s or my mid 30s. So there's a certain kind of gap of years there as well. But I just happen to have come into business really early. So I'm in a weird situation, you know, I understand the young ones. I understand I understand why Tate doesn't want to hop on, on Twitch streams because he finds it a waste of time. And I understand why these YouTuber kids that are 21 years old or whatever it is, or uh, think that they own the world. I understand both dynamics as to one why one person doesn't want to hang out with all the and why the other person that is a noob thinks he's the top G, right? Like I understand both dynamics because I'm kind of in the middle. Yeah. So yeah, it's an interesting one. I haven't seen a lot of people in kind of like their their mid to late twenties kind of in hop the on the space and, and yeah. do it. But I would love to see more people. I'm I'm always in the business of elevating because dude, there's billions of people that need to be served out there. There's billions of people that need to need this information dude people need to elevate people need to be encouraged people need to be challenged and if i can hop on the camera click click, click record drop and hang gems. out hang out with my boys and and drop some gems and hang out and kind of learn a little bit about each other and share what Lots we've learned ideas. from life 
so be it. Nice, yeah. So you went recently, we went quite viral recently on TikTok for videos about BlackRock. Mm. What is BlackRock and how do they own everything? Yeah, so BlackRock is an organization, it's a company publicly listed on NASDAQ that has tens of trillions of dollars of assets under management. And tens of yeah, tens of trillions. They, they, they disclose that they have like 14 trillion, but that is only BlackRock. Then they own majority share in most of the companies in America, right? So they also they also have money and funneled through all those those things as well. So what companies? They own Pfizer, they own Moderna, they own uh, all the airlines, they own all the social networks. So when you see all this stuff, all this agenda, kind of everybody working together, then you have to realize who actually owns it. So you go to Yahoo Finance. This isn't a you do with this. This isn't a conspiracy. You go to Yahoo Finance, you go to top holders of all these shareholding companies, and you see BlackRock and Vanguard at the top. Uh, so you go to Amazon, for example, you go to Yahoo Finance, you go to Amazon, you go to the ticker of the stock, you go to top holders, and you realize Jeff Bezos ain't, ain't the biggest holder of Amazon. And you're like, oh I shit. I think it was 9%. It's like, oh shit, he's no longer the majority shareholder of his company, so he doesn't make the final decisions, so he doesn't have the big say. And uh, who was it? The the CEO of, the, of Bank Santander. Yeah. Uh, was sitting at a round table at the FII conference and uh, they were talking about what is the problem with the current system? <laughs> and I think this was like a Freudian slip. She, she kind of slipped. I didn't think she uh, intended to say this. She said, uh, the big problem is that we have to make our investors and our shareholders happy like him. We have to make Larry Fink happy, which was sitting right next to her, wow. which was the owner of BlackRock. And she's like, we need to make him happy, right? So as you run these companies and these organizations publicly listed, you need to understand that people with money, they can come in and swoop your shit. So BlackRock is one of those organizations. I made a video about it. It did quite well on the internet. And it's not nothing new, right? It's not the only organization that kind of runs the game. You can talk about that segment and that department of kind of like, the publicly traded companies. But now, which is the crazy part, dude, is BlackRock is starting to get into the Chinese market. Mm -hmm. So they're starting to branch out their tentacles outside of the, the North American market. And uh, it's quite scary. So yeah, I mean, I think uh, autonomy, sovereignty is kind of the most important thing that people should be focused on, which is how can I make enough to be self-reliant and not have to depend on the system, depend on greedy people, depend on these psychopath that are out here to literally take everything that you're worth with no remorse whatsoever because hey it's just business that's how they see it yeah so <laughs> people have been conquering lands dude for, for for the longest time you know you see you see genghis khan you see alexander the great yeah. you see julius caesar dude these were ruthless these were killers these were killers that's why they won that's why they took over the game so if you think that at the highest echelons of business these guys aren't the same way and you don't get the game. Yeah, and what do you think about Kanye West? You know, every day he comes out with a new th statement. What do you think about what he's saying right now? I have no thoughts about Kanye West and he has zero mental uh, real estate in my mind. I would love to sit down and have a conversation with the man. Obviously, uh, he's accomplished many things, but I would like to have a conversation more with him about the metaphy metaphysical aspects of life, not so much business and careers and all this stuff that he's talking about. I would just like to converse with an interesting human. Yeah, yeah okay. Just, but he's just like everybody else, bro. You know, Kanye yeah. today, the next guy tomorrow, and it's just dope people to have a conversation with. I, I don't put people on pedestals. Yeah. There's only one top G, it's G-O-D. And anything True. besides that, just another human, another homie person to uh, live life with, and just people that are honestly figuring it out. Nice, yeah. Okay, last two questions. Number one, who is Edward Bernay? Edward Bernay. I heard you mention it. Ah, uh, yeah. So Edward Bernay, he's known as the father of propaganda. So I've talked about this. I talked about it at Tate's place. I've talked about it uh, at a couple other uh, locations. I'm very passionate about understanding the root source of the cause, mm -hmm. right? So you look at the uh, at a lot of the habits that Americans form. You're gonna start asking yourself, who instilled these thoughts? Who instilled kind of the, this philosophy and these habits? A famous one is the American, the All American Breakfast. You get your eggs, you get yeah. your bacon, you get your sausages, you get your orange juice, you get your milk. But a hundred years ago, that wasn't breakfast. That wasn't the American breakfast. A breakfast wasn't a thing, right? So people nowadays, and I saw it on TikTok, like, well, what do you want me, Luke, to starve? 
No, I want you to be conscientious about who you're who believing your with regards to the information that you have. So Edward Benet, known as the father of propaganda, also related to uh, the owner of um, Netflix, which is very interesting, right? Because Netflix is a big propaganda machine. So you see a lot of these things kind of mm. interconnecting with the cells, which is one of the reasons why I don't watch movies, which is why you asked me, is I don't like people programming my mind. I like to program my mind by it's myself. Literally, it's literally called a TV program. Correct. Like literally you watch the news and it says, it's time for your what? Your regular programming. Like they literally <laughs> tell it to you. It's like, are you ready to get programmed? All right, sit down. Turn on the TV at nine o'clock with your GMO processed bullshit food that you just pulled out of the fridge and then you put it in the microwave. You're good to go. Sit down. Eat that genetically modified corn off of that plastic container. You're chilling. Sit down for your regular programming. That's the name of the game nowadays. Edward Bernay launched uh, the breakfast campaign because the meat industry came to him and said, dude, we're slacking on meat sales. How, what can we do? So he's like, mm, it's too hard to convince the average person. It's too hard to convince the individual. I need to go to the people that are already sources of authority. So what did he go and do? He went and convinced who? The doctors, the pediatricians, that breakfast was the most essential diet with all these studies and all these, these case studies and all these scientific uh, papers that were written and all these experiments and all this bullshit. It was all paid propaganda. Very, sounds very familiar, doesn't it? Anyways, so Edward Bernay launches the breakfast propaganda campaign and turns breakfast into a rousing success. He did it as well with cigarettes. Essential. He did it as well, he did it as well with cigarettes. He was pushing cigarettes as a healthy alternative to reduce stress, to make mm. sure pregnant women had a good pregnancy. It was like that. You go to the you go to the pharmacy, you tell them to stress, they prescribe you cigarettes. <laughs> Dude, Edward Bernay. So the guy understood human psyche, understood crowd psychology, and understood that Herd the crowd mind Herd mentality. is not a rational mind. Therefore, you do not appeal to logic. You appeal to emotion, Emotions. you appeal to fear. And that's the name of the game. So you see the same agenda the same mindset and the same strategy played time and time and time again. And if you understand this, you can position yourself in such a way whereby when this happens again, like it did from 2020 to 2022 without going into details, it's going to happen again. People will be mass brainwashed. Pandemic. People will be mass, mass, like mass, mass together to form fear. The mass mentality and the mass mobs will form together and the cycle will start again. Damn. And your ability to capitalize on that by foreseeing where it's going to happen, and I can tell you where it's going to happen. I'm being ready. Where? I can literally tell you the niches where? where it's going to happen. Ready? Perfect. Climate change, another pandemic, and food supply chain. Those three things are gonna be the three biggest money-making opportunities whereby they're gonna instill fear, they're gonna instill a uh, crowd mob mentality where there's no logic involved it's purely emotional and they're going to be in a situation where they're going to get really rich whether it's through carbon credits whether it's through making and managing uh, genetically modified foods controlling the supply chain and ultimately there will be in a situation or in a scenario where they'll make the plan work so prepare yourself position yourself and you can get rich i i was able to uncover it this last time and I think it's gonna happen again soon. So yeah. mark my words. I'm not popular when I say these things, but I'm usually right. And you soon will be when these statements come to fruition. They will, 100%. And, okay, last and final question, and then we wrap it up. It's been a great episode. Last and final question. What do you think now this new technology, well, it's not new, but this new open chat has come out. Uh, chat GPT, you heard of it, of course, I'm sure. Uh, have you seen it? How can people use this in their businesses? People are using it for copy. People are using it to send emails. AI is here, chat GP, uh, well, AI, well, to a the certain bro extent. The brokies, the brokies have been exposed to the AI. They're yeah. using it for bullshit. <laughs> Let me tell you something. Okay. I was talking to the one of our Capital Club members who just sold his uh, software company. He's a Swiss guy and he, and he works with AI. He works with uh, machine learning and things of this nature. And he said, if you think this AI that was released to the public is actually what they have out there, you're sadly mistaken. They've given you crumbs, samples of what they've had for over a decade. What they actually have in the back end is AI that teaches itself, 
right? So they don't know what the AI is teaching itself at this point. It's creative thinking. It's well, it's 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 programmed to teach itself. So you don't know what it's learning in real time. Wow. It's believable. So I think AI has a lot of value in society. I think AI is going to be kind of like a really good sidekick for a lot of people. But you need to be able to think Use outside it. of the box. If you think that the extent of your AI is to make your emails and your <laughs> right, that should be you testing to see if it works. You need to be using AI to think for you. Nikola Tesla talks about this idea of memorizing and retaining thoughts in your mind as a clutter waste of energy. Why? Because in order for you to retain a thought or in order for you to develop a concept or in order for you to solve a problem, what? You have to expend energy. Yeah. But what if you could conserve that energy by creating, like in this case, AI that could do those things on your behalf? Instead of being a lazy piece of shit, you should be utilizing your mental real estate to understand how to control and how to wield the the AI to do what you need it to do. Yeah, this it. Yeah, and that's where you're going to differentiate the big players from the small players is how that is implemented. You could literally right now be like, okay, uh, AI, write me a tweet. It'll spit out a tweet for yeah. you. But the intelligent person is out here really asking the AI questions that are deep, 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 deep questions to start developing the train of thought to find to find deep solutions. So if people are just using it as some sort of Siri tool, it just shows the level of intelligence that they have as an individual. Mm -hmm. And I think the most capable individuals understand that AI is just another employee. Yeah. that you could utilize this as a super employee to run your organization in a very streamlined and effective manner. So if you're not using AI yet, uh, start thinking about it, start incorporating it, but not into micro bullshit levels. Think think bigger and uh, it'll be a successful and useful tool. Nice, amazing. Last question, a lot of people are coming up right now. They watch you, look, they look up to you. What advice could you give someone right now on the come up? Let's say, you know, it doesn't matter the age, but he's on the come up of his journey. What advice would you give him? is to make a plan. Okay. Most people do not make a plan for their life. They don't know what they want. They don't know where they're going. Dude, I ask a person, what do you have planned for next week? They don't, they don't know what they're doing today, right? So how are you supposed to move in life with intention if you're moving like an accident? It's not gonna work. Mm, live with intention. Brother, <laughs> business, life is like archery. That's what I compare it to. If you have no goal, you have no target, there's nothing to hit. Without a goal, you can't score. That's the first part. The second part, is you need to have a tool. You need to have a bow, you need to have an arrow in order to hit your target. Right. The next thing is you have to aim. It requires pepper preparation. You need to understand the spacing, the distance, the humidity, the temperature, mm -hmm. all these variables in order to what? Factors, yeah. Hit the target. Hit the target. And then finally, you have to what? Shoot. Let go. Shoot, mm, you have action. to take action. Mm. Most people have no goal. They don't know where they're going. They haven't calculated or measured what it's going to take to achieve the bullseye, yeah. and they don't take action. So in life, if you wanna achieve a bullseye, you have to be willing to set a target, you have to be willing to aim, prepare, understand the nature of what you're about to do, and you have to shoot, you have to take action. And with enough iteration, eventually you'll get good enough to hit the bullseye. And that, my friend, is a secret to success. <laughs> Amazing. Luke Belmore, thank you so much for your time. Guys, if you watch this video, please leave a like. Check out Luke on all his platforms. Like and subscribe. Uh, this, this, this guy's doing some serious shit here. So I'm proud of you, bro. You're a young one. I see you leveling up. Thank you so Anything much. Anything that you need, I'm uh, one phone call away. Hope this was a value to you guys. And yeah, yeah uh, thank you so much. 2023 is ours, G. That's Let's run it. Man. Where do you see yourself in five years? I don't, I don't know, G. We'll see. <laughs>